and I'm currently working on Conflict 47 for them. Roger here is a co-designer, also works for Warlord, he's done Acting Panzer most recently, ton of work for Bolt Action, ton of work for uh, Blood Red Skies and we work together on, directly together on Judge Dredd for the 2000 AD games. So I'll stop standing around mm -hmm. and tell you what's going on. Um, well, I should just take questions, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. That would be the easier thing. Who would like to ask a question? I'll just keep talking otherwise. <laughs> oh, there we have one. A few. Yeah, well, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. No, just some. This is fine. Uh, give me a tea, please. So no, sorry. Sugar. <laughs> one sugar, please. Oh, one sugar. Yeah. What, what can you tell us about Conflict 47? What's uh, absolutely what's nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we had an email around yesterday telling us that we're not allowed to say anything, so I'm going to tell you a limited amount of things. Um, for those who don't know what Conflict 47 is, it's a bolt action based game, a Weird War 2 bolt action based game that uh, will currently producers, but it's getting a bit long in the tooth now, and they're looking to do a new edition of it to go with the Bolt Action 3rd edition that's just coming out. So, schooled by doing the 2000 AD games, of which we've done four or five of them now, and they, they always use the same core rules, uh, modified to suit different comic strip titles in the 2000 AD range. And that taught me an important lesson uh, for any games designer to learn, which is actually people really enjoy it when you don't change the rules. Um, <laughs> because they don't have to learn a new set. Um, particularly if the, there's two sets of rules that are very close to each other and you make a few changes. And that's kind of one of the traps that Conflict 47 had fallen into. So, first of all, what is Conflict 47? It's a bolt action game. Um, it is its own thing though, it's not bolt action, it's a standalone thing, but it uses the bolt action rules. What we're engaged with at the moment is adding in some elements to add, uh, the Conflict 47 all revolves around the idea that these rifts get opened up by atom bombs through which strange energies pour and things change basically. So we get a very alternate timeline. Although digging into Conflict 47's current background, we've realised that it actually started diverging before that, uh, before the bombs even dropped. So we're working on that background and um, working on rules that will basically add rift technology, and uh, rift creatures and things like that to the bolt action set as it currently stands. Uh, I'm literally physically going through third edition bolt action rules and writing zombie and things like that. Um, which has been interesting because bolt action itself, of course, is, is built around the idea. It's men with rifles versus men with rifles at its baseline. And you kind of, you know, you build on HE and tanks and all the rest of it from there, from that baseline. So that is involuable. Thank you. Uh, in itself, but that we can still play around, you know, add things that aren't there before, even take stuff that's already there in bolt action and kind of embiggen it quite a bit. Uh, the, the example we were just talking about was armour, for example. There is some basic body armour done in bolt action, so we can play around with that and do personal armour at higher and higher levels to represent Conflict 47 powered armour and things like that. Um, in the process of that, we'll be redoing all the army lists as well, but another part of the brief for it is to embrace the current range of Conflict 47. But anybody who's got an army now will be able to use it under the new Conflict 47 as the plan. Uh, hopefully we'll give you more reasons for using things like walkers and werewolves and zombies. Yeah. That's my plan. Um, but it's, at its baseline, you know, it kind of works from this idea that you can take a bolt action army, add a few Conflict 47 units to it, Bingo, you've got a Conflict 47 army. We're all trying to lure you. We're going to try and lure you into going like, oh no, I want a Conflict 47 army. Actually, I want to give all my guys assault rifles because, hey, it's 1947, so we can. And so on. Uh, and just playing around with things in the timeline. So some real history, some completely fake made up history, but a lot of the inspiration that I'm taking for it is uh, comic books, pulp, 30s pulp in particular, uh, but also some kind of atom punk as well as diesel punk, if you want to get into the different kinds of punk we're talking about. Because at the, at the top end of it, of course, from 47, you're starting to look at Korean War, you're starting to look at space race, silvery suits, all that kind of stuff. 
uh, rocket fighters and yeah. so on, which is uh, Roger's specialist subject. <laughs> Tell people what your favourite plane is. My favourite plane is the B-36, um, is the B-36 Peacemaker. Yeah, Six piston it. engines, four jet engines. Yeah, it's enormous. Yeah. It's it is fantastic. gigantic. Yeah, so yeah. much so you've gone and played, paid homage to it in person, haven't you? I have. I've been to see... The Great God B-36. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, from my perspective, I've always been very much interested in sort of the, the weird World War uh, stuff, the... You know, the Luftwaffe 46 type type things of what might have been, thankfully weren't, yeah. but what might what might have yeah. been. And one of the nice things about the um, the concept of, 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 the, of the riffs is that it's it's not so much that it's just total weirdness flowing through, but some of the stuff that flows through there means that some of the things that we that a day at the time or scientists at the time thought could not be possible could be made possible so if you had jet engines and you couldn't build them because you simply didn't have the right uh, materials or whatever or the right metals for it we've probably got alchemy now so you mm. can transmute and create what you want the there's, there's potential for ai so these unstable airplanes may fly again so it's it, it's basically sort of freeing up not only sort of the, the the real sort of the occulty type weirdness but also all that sort of 19 late 1940s super science type thing as well mm. the the american you know the american 1950s early 1950s films bringing any all, all, all and any of that type of stuff into it yes yeah if you, if you see the source of man type films as well from the 50s they're, they're also something like at the moment, we're still fighting about whether we'll get to do literal flying saucers, but um, <laughs> it's 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 it's, it's certainly not so, uh, Martian about fighting idiot. machines. Martian, Martian fighting machines. machines. Well, we have fighting machines, okay. uh, Martian ones. I don't know if we'll ever get to Mars. <laughs> uh, well, well, I sit on the moon first, but again, for now. We're, we're worrying about the main rules. It basically, what I'm trying to recreate is kind of the effect that Rogue Trader had when it first hit, uh, all, the, all those years ago, 1988, and where yeah. it's a galaxy of possibility, it's a world <coughs> war of possibilities, and um, part of that process is going to, you know, be making it possible for people to play around with it and have fun. It's a really strong theme. I love it myself. I worked before in Palais Prentice, Dust Universe, which again is a very weird war. They don't have werewolves there, they have intelligent apes instead, but other than that, they do also have zombies, it must be said, and lasers, and walkers. <laughs> um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of shared DNA uh, that goes on with this particular genre, and you can see it as well in Wolfenstein and stuff like that. There's a number of movies that follow the same thing, Iron Skies, all the rest of it. So it's a rich vein to plug into, and it's not so much about, you know, what can't we do, it's like, what can we do? Mm. Uh, up to the crazy, and I do. I love the uh, the idea of the technology side of it as well because uh, we made this connection earlier on when I was talking. Like, I was brought up. I was born in 1966, so I was brought up very very post-war in a way. Uh, and a lot of the things that influenced me when I was young was was World War Two stuff, air fix, I guess, and so forth. Like a lot of people, a lot of, like a lot of us, made Warlord what it is mm. basically. But in with that as well was Jerry Anderson. So it's all Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds and so forth like that. That's in my child brain fighting for, for dominance as well. And I think that's why I like Weird War 2 so much because it kind of encompasses both things. And uh, I want to try and bring some of that along as well. So, there we go. I told you what to talk. Yeah. That's what we're doing for Gone Before. So, you at the back, sir. The, the, the thought I should be three that's just come out. We've seen them taking all the Army's old books, condensing mm. down as, I think, to the back of the. Yes. We've got the factions at the moment, K47, spread over three books. So you've sort of oh, there, there will all be in that, sort of that core rule book, yeah. And, and do you anticipate that happening at launch, so all the factions? Yeah, yeah literally, the literally in, the, in the rule book. Basically, we want to mirror what Bolt Action does. Mm. Yeah. In yeah. terms of, yeah, we'll have the, the core factions, and there, there will only be, I'm only planning to do five. Okay. You know, if you, if you play Italians in... Um, Conflict 47, I must apologise to you now, or Finns for that matter. Uh, you will be getting rolled into the Axis along with everybody else. Um, because that's the way we have to deal with it, because we're doing, dealing with five factions. So we'll have the US, Commonwealth, the Axis, as it will be, uh, the, the Soviet bloc, because it includes China, and Imperial Japan. So th that was the biggest chunk that came out of the supplements was actually the, the Imperial Japan, that was a full army. So I'm taking that on board. Other stuff, not so much. Obviously new units that came out in there, again, will encompass them yeah. because it's part of that plan to have everything that got made for Conflict 47, we will cover in the rules. Yeah. Missing. Hopefully be a bit better than they currently are in the rules. Mm -hmm. You, sir. 
So potentially, could you do something like kind of Conflict Book Seven and Blood Red Skies kind of combined? So you've got yes, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're starting to see through my tissue thin approach. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the things we've talked about. And again, we've not settled on actually doing anything yet. This is by no means a commitment to releases. Um, is that we can do, could do, stuff for Blood Red Skies. You know, we can do some Foo Fighters. Uh, and some of those unfeasible jets and aircraft that wouldn't work. We can potentially make a few models for those. Um, which would be nice. Maybe, who knows, we might be able to do an entire starter set for Blood Red Skies based around Conflict 47 at some point. Um, but we've also got Cruel Seas, we've also got Victory at Sea mm -hmm. as well. And again, we can potentially put in some Tesla weapons, you know, for uh, swapping out on your battleship <coughs> and so on and so on. So there's stuff we can do, you know, um, Godzilla was my wow. favourite for Victorious. <laughs> again, that, that's a fight we've yet to have, is the Kaiju fight. But anyway, um, that's part of the appeal of it. When we do have World War II, we have this big grounding of like all these different vehicles, all these different armies fighting, and actually different game systems that they've been rendered into as well. Mm. And we've done the legwork for Blood Red Sky specifically. We've already gone into Jets because we did a Korean War supplement for MIG, MIG Alley. So we kind of know uh, how to do it as we start moving forward. And what I said about the, uh, the accelerated timeline of technology means we can have our MIGs and Sabres in 1947 if we feel like it. Maybe a little bit later, yeah. but it's certainly something we're, we're keen to work towards. And obviously, me and Roger, we're, we're very dug in on Blood Red Skies itself, um, and we have plenty of connections through to the guys who do Cruel Seas and Victory at Sea. So uh, it's not outside the realm of possibility, yeah. and we have talked about it as a possibility. So I can't commit because it's Wardle's decision to do it. Mm. It'll basically come down to how successfully uh, Combat Boy Seven itself launches, I imagine. If it goes gangbusters, then there'll be a sudden scramble to do as many Conflict 47 things as possible. And uh, we'll pick off that fruit as we go. But, uh, I'll say, maybe, maybe, I'm hoping, it'll be fun. <laughs> you, sir, at the back there. Oh, no, you, we've had one from you. Let's just take this guy first. How far in the timeline do you think K-47 could go forward? You know, could we get things like Vietnam and, and the Gulf-style equipment? <laughs> It starts to diverge um, earlier than that, and whether we get to Vietnam per se, probably not, because we will never end up with a situation like Vietnam in this war, just like we won't actually end up with a, a Korean War in this timeline, because the World War is still ongoing. Mm. Now they might fight in Korea at some Vietnam. point, yep. <laughs> um, but there won't be a Vietnam War, and they might have helicopter gunships at some point. I want helicopters. But there won't be. Yeah, if that's what you want, then maybe. I mean, they, they, again, they were flying around helicopters at the end of World War II. Yeah. Uh, and they used them in the Korean War in a limited capacity, but a lot of development got killed off by the end of the Second World War. Nobody wants to spend money on armaments that much anymore, because they had entire economies to rebuild. Yeah. So we can certainly work with it. Well, that'd be a challenge actually for Blood Red Skies, wouldn't it? Helicopters. It certainly would. Yeah. <laughs> They're so slow. We want helicopters. That's my experience in Ace Combat, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You fly in, bomb something. Helicopter. Oh, yeah, helicopter. Turn around, come back. Oh, helicopter's still there. <laughs> Hasn't moved. <laughs> <laughs> it's going as fast as it's can. You know. It's such a it's such a rapid increase in the technology as well of what would what couldn't be available as as Andy was saying you know, the idea of you know, swept wing jets um, anti tank guided missiles um, anything that sort of you know electronically based that you know wasn't possible in our in our timeline as you might say is potentially possible there so you know everybody will probably have night sights everybody will probably have um, you know assault rifle type weapons or access to it um, so yeah this isn't it's just it's just to make those things. It's, it's, it's to put the proper we you know really out what I think this this should be doing we really do put the weird into into the World War Two yes thing. lots lots of weird so weird Vietnam War perhaps <laughs> but it won't be what you think it is uh, that kind of approach to things yeah uh, but jungle war yeah mm. certainly uh, and so on and so forth so we can take inspiration from all, all sorts of points in history uh, and fictional places that this is the glory mm. of it it's freedom really. Historical is nice because it gives you a nice solid grounding in things, but it also tells you how things are. Mm -hmm. And we're not bound by that so much in Conflict 47, which is, is honestly where I'm used to being, so it makes me happy. 
it's true. You just make things up and try and make them work against each other and not make people want to murder each other in real life. It's, <laughs> it's simple. So, sorry, sir, you at the back, you had a question. So you said that you're going to carry on all, all the units that we've got, we're going to be able to use. Mm -hmm. What's your, both you, what's your favourite Conflict 47 unit, fluff-wise, or not necessarily game-wise, but something you think is really cool? And also, which one did you look in the book and go, I wish you didn't have to? Look in the book and wish we didn't have it. Mm, Italians, probably, <laughs> if I'm honest. Like, two units, like Italian powered armor. Sorry, Alessio, that wasn't pointed at you. <laughs> um, and some Italian jump packers, it's like, why even bother? So that kind of dispersion of effort into minor things. Um, the thing I like the best in it is actually the walkers. Mm. And there's some really solid walker designs. The multi-leg ones aren't as strong. Um, they could do with the redesign, but the, the two-legged walkers are just solid. They're nice designs. And I say that as somebody who worked on dust with beautiful, beautiful mm. two-legged walkers. So that's pretty good. Yeah, they're my favourites. Um, in game terms, at the end of the day, it's a tank with legs. So, I mean, not that much of a challenge to do with the rules, as you might imagine. Uh, so in game rule terms, the thing I'm enjoying most is probably, eh, I don't know, actually, it's a toss-up. Rift weapons is interesting, but the actual units like werewolves and stuff like that is interesting to try and make them work in bolt actions. So, but that's not really what you're asking overall. Would I have an army of werewolves? Probably not. <laughs> Would I have a, an army of walkers and powered armor? Mm, probably. Yeah. Rule of cool. Yeah, rule of cool. Absolutely. I always like the heavy armor types and weird warrior. It just works for me. I'm a big Wolfenstein fan as well, of course. So we've ended n endless numbers of them. Mm, my favourite, my favourite, I think, are the um, are the British, like the automated infantry and the like. I yeah, just, they I are, they yeah. are neat. Actually, yeah. I like them too. It's very sort of sky captain, world future. Yep. Yeah, that, that, yep. that type of thing, and uh, this whole idea is sort of really clunky, clanky AI, and um, I, I, I just like I just like the look of the look of those things very much. Um, I'm not too keen on the on the German super soldiers. They just look weird to me. Um, I'm well, sure. like the werewolves. And stuff. Well, no, those those. The wingy, the wingy, wingy. Well, they're nasty. Yeah, they're them, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, I can't, yeah, can't yeah. imagine saying, I'm going to become one of them. I'm going to start off as, as hands and tomorrow I'm going to be. Well, it's not like they've got a choice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> overall. That's so. That's true. But, and and, and it's, it will, like Andy, are very much like the walkers. Um, they are sort of, you know, archetypal sort of weirdness. And, uh, and that's one of the things, you know, to, to, to take into the game. You know um, what makes what, why 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 are walkers so successful? You know why why does everyone have walkers now and, and not have more tanks? So it's sort of you know doing the various things and the rules and whatever that makes it. You realise why those why they are preferable. You know whether it be in a mobility or whether it be stability of shooting or, or whatever. So yes, they have advantages yeah. basically. And yeah, yeah, they wouldn't work in the real world. Guess what? We're not in the real world, mm. so we're not bound by those rules. Mm. We have super good alloys and powerful engines and power sources and all the rest of it to make it work. Um, that being said, you know, fortunately we have a robust set of rules that covers vehicles very mm. well, so vehicles will still be a, a perfectly viable option. Mm. Uh, they'll do their job just as they do in bolt action. It's just walkers do it a little bit better mm. uh, overall. So it becomes more of a stylistic choice. You, sir, you get your hand up. Um, thanks. I think you've sort of touched on it a little bit with the, the challenges of incorporating things like the werewolves. So you mm. talked a lot about the technology um, mm. uh, that's going to be available or the, with technology, um, and certainly you know having more widespread armor or different mm. armors, etc. But how do you plan to incorporate the more sort of tooth and claw foot troops into that world because they seem out very at odds? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. It, it's, well, they're, they're tricky, and Conflict 47, as it currently stands, kind of struggles with them a little bit. One of the things I, I when I went through it, the thing I, I disliked very strongly in the army list was the fact that they end up with like a, a big stack of special rules attached to them, which also aren't explained in the army list, and just send you off to actually several different places to try and find out what they mean. Um, so I'm trying to move away from that a little bit. With limited success, it must be heard. They, they do need several special rules to make them work, but with the right special rules, I think we can. Um, making them tough enough is, is the biggest thing overall, mm. but I mean, bolt action works off a damage value, so you can just mm. assign them a damage value of more than six, 
and suddenly they become a lot tougher and so on and so forth. So I don't want to get into multiple wounds for them necessarily. But yeah, that, that's that's under under works at the moment about how we handle things like zombies, uh, Nat Yeagers, werewolves. It's all bloody Axis stuff, really. Oh, and, and Japan, they have zombies too. Um, they are kind of this, they're a, a separate thing. But within that, there's also the Paragon stuff as well. Um, the patriotic daughters, the daughters of the revolution, mm. whatever they're called, um, and so on. So that there are a few other what I'm terming rift units uh, in other armies. So basically, a big chunk of the bolt-on rules that I've been talking about that work with bolt action are introducing rift units and how they work and what mm. makes them special. And they share mechanics. Well, they're, they're, you know, some of it mechanically is shared with rift weaponry as well, mm. things like Tesla guns. So. Um, and that'll be, that's something additional to bolt action. That will be an extra set of rules to learn, but not too cumbersome, hopefully, is the plan. And that should give me enough extra levers to pull to make oddities like those and potentially others as well along the way. So, yeah, that, that, is, a, that is the thing. That's the main challenge, actually, within it, is making them work properly. Yeah, because the, 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 weird, the weird is to include both, as you say, the technological type advancements, but the... The missing part, in some respects, currently is is, is is the other weird, almost like the occult weird. What 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 is it? Well, you know, what is it that drives the yeah? This is it. We've got gothic, gothic horror elements mm. running around. Yeah. You know, we've got literal undead and um, werewolves. So that's part of it. You know, we're not going to exclude that, and it's going to be worth taking and important and powerful. Um, and that is a bit that kind of can't work exactly like bolt, bolt action because mm. that works on men with rifles as, as a baseline, and they're not men. Yeah. They become not into something else. So yeah, that's something we're working on, uh, and we'll be testing as well. Mm. Turning up to that. like you know a Tesla where can fight with a set of fangs. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, it, it, yeah. in some ways it's there for rift weapons as well. It, it, yeah. the, one of the difficulties at the moment with the, the current Conflict Force Seven rules is that Tesla guns are kind of like oh, it's it's a decent anti-tank gun. Mm. Is really what it comes down to. And um, I'm trying to make them a bit more than that, uh, potentially, but also a little bit more unpredictable and things like that. Well, no, that's not true. Not unpredictable directly, but labour intensive, shall we say, mm. in terms of management. Mm. It's, 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 it's put those little traits and differences into them that, as Andy says, it just it's not just a, oh, I'm taking a Tesla weapon, so oh, basically that's just swapping around a few stats and it just becomes like a, you know, a, a Pack 40 anti tank gun or, a, or, or, or an 88 or something like that, but those little nuances that, that actually, you know, against the weird part of it. They, I mean, I think the thing that's said about the, with the Conflict 47 units is that, you know, they've got to be better than the World War II units. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we want to do that, not just, you know, just up gun them, up gun them, up gun them without any explanation about it, but put something in there that actually sort of thematically so you say you know this is a not just a tether, it's a death ray you mm. know this is, you know, this is this can carve a tank in half or something like a tank in half yeah. it's that that sort of future shock type thing mm. which is part of what will lure you eventually into having more and more of these units in what you thought was just a bolt action unit an mm. army with a few <laughs> conflict 47 units and then oh my god i've turned around and now it's an entire army that mm. sort of stuff yeah hello yes i mean picking up directly on that because mm. i think one of the things that certainly we found with the first version mm. was that the weird stuff, the rift stuff, was competitively, at least from a strict points efficiency point of view, yeah. it really fell behind mm. the... It's weirdly underplayed. I, I yeah. couldn't quite understand why they'd gone to the trouble of putting it all in there and then made it so vanilla tasting. Mm. Mm. If you see what I mean, the background suffers from it as well. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be critical of the guys yeah. who did this because they, they wrote a load of stuff, and it's no small thing mm. to, to create a book and a couple of supplements. Um, but it, it's like they made the decision to do it, and then they kind of pulled back yeah. from wanting to be too weird with it. They're like, oh no, we don't want to be that weird, and yet they still have zombies. And it's very strange. It's very strange. Mm. It's very conservatively written. Mm. Uh, it's suffice to say, uh, and that includes in the rules aspect as yeah. well. <coughs> Um, those of you who know my work know that I'm not a conservative <laughs> rules writer <laughs> overall. Quite notorious for it, actually. So uh, I'm just laying my freak flag fly on that front to a certain extent. And I've told my playtesters it's like it's it's like serial killer stuff. Somebody stop me! 
basically. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't, then it'll go in like it is. Um, although, we've got a very small group that we're talking to in, in the first term who were super volunteers. Their, their first response when I showed them some of the things I was thinking of for refuse was like, it, it's not competitive enough, it's not good enough, basically. Which was kind of good for me. It, I was a little bit put off by their, their response because I, I was really, really proud of it, sort of thing. Oh, this is really interesting. But when I looked at it, and particularly through that lens, I could see what their concern was. And I felt like it was more of a sort of like read it on paper and it comes across as like that could be the case. Actually, it wouldn't be in real life. But that doesn't matter to a certain extent. You know, if people read it and go, well, this just sounds rubbish, I don't want to use it and then I'm going to use it, and you kind of lost the fight before you even start at that point. So it has kind of shifted that. It's unpredictability is the biggest thing. I'm, I'm used to doing some quite unpredictable armies in the past. When I used to work at Games Workshop, I did you know, Orcs and Skaven and stuff like this. Uh, I tended to get the bag for things like that. Where, to a certain extent, the player base just encompasses the idea of like random predictability and blowing your own guys up as, as part of the fun. Mm. Um, that that's a particular strain of player overall. <laughs> um, I have to admit, they're a fairly self-selecting group that enjoys that a lot. Um, as a more general, it's not a good route to go down, though. So, uh, although we didn't have weapons that literally blew you up, um, there, I could see that there were things to worry about in there if you didn't think that your dice would be kind to you and things like that. So, fair enough, you know work that through. But it's been good, it's worked through the process a little bit more and now we've got something that still has what I wanted, which is like not complete predictability, but actually that's far more in, in your control than it was in my earlier draft. So anyway, sorry, specific examples getting down to you, which I'm not supposed to either. Um, yes. <laughs> Long story short, you at the back. So. Do you envision, envision um, at launch um, new weird units for all of your five factions, or are we just staying with the ones that have already been designed? Like, can we get something better than a set of dogs for the British? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to write more dogs at some point. Um, Obviously, you can't get into specifics, but. Yeah, yeah. Our first port of call is making sure that everything's covered. Um, beyond that, yes, I would like to do some more interesting stuff with the rule book army list themselves. Even if it's just options uh, for like swapping out guns on walkers, for example, you know, to a certain extent, even if Warlord aren't going to make models of that, uh, it'll be like, well, go hang. There, there are Tesla models; people can, you know, make their own. So it will encompass some of that along the way. New units at that point, it depends on how they get on with the old units to a certain extent, um, and so on. So that's up in the air. Probably something new, I would hope. Because for returning conflict forty seven players it's a bit sad if you open the book and it's just exactly what you had before. Um but we may have to do the newness through options and things like that. Um we'll have to see where we go. Wool is so assured of being on many occasions that they are fully backing this project and it's got everything behind it, so uh, so hopefully, yeah. But I'm not gonna tell you what they are. <laughs> Don't even know. Uh, you sir, at the back again. Um, how do you envisage it sitting within the version three sort of platoon company structure? Are we going to have a K forty seven platoon within the company, or are we going to have K forty seven units with each of the platoons? Uh, question to be resolved. Mm. Overall, I am imagining we will do like specialised uh, platoons. Will be the way to do it, but. Companies. I kind of feel like your your werewolves or your zombies or what have you should be operating a separate platoon rather than just attached mm. to a regular infantry platoon. That also means that we can do interesting HQ models for them, zombie commander, zombie <laughs> meister, and things like that. So that 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 seems to be a more fertile ground to me. Overall, the whole company thing. I don't know. It's been one step at a time. We'll see what we get to with that. Um. It's an interesting one when we get to walkers specifically, maybe walker platoons, maybe they're just an alternate for your armoured platoon at the end of the day. But yeah, I want to, I want to em embrace the structure that's there. Mm. Uh, I 
and build on it and basically put the cartoons or as uh, as their own distinct platoons. Because I say with some things like I don't know jump troops maybe and powered on, you could see them going integrating more into the existing platoon structure. Mm -hmm. Weird, really weird stuff like zombies, like werewolves, like Nash Jaeger. You can see them having their own platoons. Uh, and in some cases, potentially both. I mean, we might have powered armour platoons, for example, but also the possibility to have a unit or whatnot, uh, or two of platoons uh, in your regular infantry platoon, just as seconded from you know, division or what have you. You could have separate, you know, like, like a specialised jump jump platoon, which you know incorporates jump jump infantry, but also any jump-capable walkers as well. So yeah. there's like sort of a deep... Don't use the word deep striking unit, you know. So we're only starting to scratch the surface on the armor list themselves at the current time, Uh, but certainly, like everything else, the Bolt Action 3 forms the model for it and we will conform to that as best we can. Is there a ballpark timeline? Is there, one? is there a ballpark timeline? Do we I am not allowed to tell you anything about timelines. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy way of dealing with it, isn't it? Uh, I can tell you that I'm working on the rules right now. Uh, me and Roger are working on the rules right now, and you might have seen that there's been an announcement for the. I've gathered together a little writing team from some old familiar faces, to me at least. Uh, some of them very old, actually. Um, and we're working away at the moment, and. I don't generally pick some up and something up and start working on it unless I have a plan to end it in end it all within a fairly short time frame. It's rare that I just kick things around for a long time. Uh, we actually started a few months back on prep and things like that. So we're on it. Um, Warlord does miniatures. Warlord does art. Warlord does layout. So that's on their timeline, and I can't speak to that at all overall. But kind of sooner rather than later. Um, I think they want to try and capitalise on Bolt Action 3 coming out and going like, oh, here's something else. You, sir. Um, with um, like newer models and things like that, mm. is there any idea whether they're going to do them in plastics or wall or resin or sticking to the standard resin types? Um, I'm led to understand that resin is the way forward mm. these days, that everything made in resin. So any existing metal models will probably be remade in resin instead. Um, plastics. Yes, we've talked about it. Uh, there seems keen <laughs> on the part of Warlord to go down that route and do things in wood, in plastic for wood. What they are exactly, we haven't nailed down yet, uh, or even whether we'll definitively be doing them and what we should do with plastic. Because there's an argument with plastic that do you do whole frames that are just for Conflict 47? Do you do like conversion frames for existing bolt action plastic and things like that? You can do that, but then it starts to sort of drag you a bit off course <coughs> straight away because it starts dragging you back to bolt action with you know Tesla guns attached or what have you, which is kind of slightly missing the point. So, in some ways, unless the plastic's going to be for Conflict Forty Seven, uh, I'd almost rather we didn't do it. Mm. Uh, I mean, conversion frames is great, but only within the, the wider context of actually making you know miniature sets or walkers or whatever in plastic. So we'll see how we go with that. I believe they have budget for it and they seem keen, so hopefully, yes. Ah, there we go, we've run out. <laughs> Marvellous. No one else wants to know anything? Oh, yes we do. <laughs> it's a random question. It's more about area of effect. Yep. And so, for example, mortars. Yep. Great at laying down smoke, and it remains in play, and it might drift. Or it, if you miss where you're right, where you're aiming at, yeah. the smoke still lands and, and, and has an effect. Yeah. He. Yeah. If you miss with that, it just misses and disappears. Yeah, I'd say that's more of a problem with smoke than uh, he. Frankly, yeah. like um, rather notoriously, I remove smoke rules from the games I play because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're bad for the game. Yeah. Uh, they, they encourage a really passive style of gameplay that's not good. So I will be reviewing the smoke rules as part of uh, <laughs> going through Conflict 47. And indeed, the prevalence of infrared technology may render smoke more or less useless on this battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. So yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see how we go with that. The HE rules are the HE rules. Uh, I'm not going to put scatter into them. 
Rift weapons, though. Like a bit of weapons, etc. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bring back the old Vortex. <laughs> yeah. I've already had one suggestion to put it back in. And honestly, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite. I loved that. Yeah, well, people do. Well, they love it and they hate it, but they remember it. Yes. Yeah. So I, I am actually quite tempted to put the old Why vortex assassin? grenade back in. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. An assassin in a vortex grenade. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's a moment everyone lives and dies for. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and I say with that idea that it's, it's kind of like harking back to mm. a traitor and stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm kind of open to it as a, an homage, shall we say. I don't know that we can call it the Vortex Grenade, but we could call it the Gravity Vortex or something like Vortex that. Vortex of Doom. Like that. And so on. So, yeah, we, we, can, we can have some fun with that. Just call it a holy hand grenade. Yeah, I mean, it, it fits in with the... You know, you've never seen anything like this in bolt action, have you? So, uh, it, it does fit the bill. It fills the brief in. So. You, sir. Going on from the sort of smoke question, would you sort of consider going from smoke to say gas? Uh, what's a weapon type? Yeah. Mm, it, I, the question with all of these things is, is usually what does it give you? All right. What does it give you towards the game? I mean, setting aside background or what's exciting, rogue trooper, you know, chem clouds, all the rest of them. What does it do for the game? If it seems like it would do something interesting for the game, sure. If it doesn't, well, then it's just a bunch of rules that aren't actually improving the game, so maybe not. Tell me more about your idea. Well, no, I've, yeah. I've, I've literally just been playing Helldivers 2 for the past few days. Okay. Yeah. And they brought out more gas weapons, and it's just right. on my mind. I just <laughs> was going from smoke, and I was thinking, could you turn it into, say, gas? Yeah. Into some sort of way to... You could, but the gentleman brought up why... In some ways, the smoke rules are a bit of a problem right now, mm. is because in some ways it's better than HE because you still get a result if you miss. Mm. All right, you do the same thing with gas; you get the same problem. Yeah. The other thing that you've now given yourself, gifted yourself on the battlefield, is something extra to keep track of. Mm. How long does the gas hang along for? You know, mm. Does it drift? All that sort of stuff, which is all. It can all be done. Mm. You know, there there are methodologies for doing this in wargaming. For Christ's sake, we know this. The question is, is it worth it? Mm. And what do you get out of it? And that's kind of why I'm so against smoke rules and blind rules and things like that. So like, you can do them mechanically, absolutely. Mm. What they do is they bog down your game, make boring things happen, and are, are generally a waste of everyone's time. So for the odd occasion when it works perfectly and you, you get the smoke in the right position or the gas in the right position, mm. you're waffing around endlessly. <laughs> Rolling dice for templates that don't matter and all the rest of it, and and then resolving the end arguments between the players about whether the line of sight actually does exist or it doesn't exist. Or oh god, yeah, let alone yeah. all that, and yeah, oh, it, it doesn't reach the base. Yes, it does, and <coughs> just don't think, <laughs> think. Do you need it? Do you want it? Do you really want it? And that I kind of need you quite a bit with things like persistent weapons. Um, with the exception of the Vortex Grenade. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's an interesting edge case, because what the Vortex Grenade does is it doesn't do the, oh, you can't see quite as well if you're in us, or, you know, oh, now you need to take a test or get poisoned. It kills you if it lands on you. You're gone. Yeah. If it touches you, you're gone. And it's a very simple mechanic yeah. and exciting. And that's why that one works. Whereas I always feel like, and every, every time I've ever played a game that's all like smoke or gas, never feels like it's really worth the amount of energy mm. that it's taking up to mm. resolve it. So uh, I tend to be a bit like, nee. unless, I, unless I decide it's there for a reason and want to. Some persistent weapons, like it leaves something behind and all danger if you go close to it, that is something I've been thinking about mm. for Rift weaponry, yes. Because obviously, with it being alternative, you can go a little bit more <coughs> real crimey with some of the weapons. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, they will be very war crimey. Um, but I mean, it's you, we've literally got zombies running around already. So the uh, the definition of what constitutes a war crime, I mean, it's World War, post World War Two. Anyway, Obviously, the morality is going to be a little bit different. Mm, yes, mm. yes. Mm. So, mm, yeah. I was just going to say, it's interesting you mentioned a uh, rogue trooper there, because that's a yeah. sort of notable absence from the. 2000 AD. I know, it's one we've talked about before quite a lot. Um, I don't know where Wall's at with doing more 2000 AD titles. 
Well, yeah, because there's a limit of spells, but. Yeah, we, we have done quite a few yeah, yeah. at this point. We did ABC <laughs> Warriors not so long ago. Um, in, in the past, when we've talked about it, Rogue Trooper, there, there were two that stood out as being potential next ones, and that was Nemesis the Warlock and Rogue Trooper. Uh, and as to which one, it's a bit of a toss-up. Um, they've both got a lot going for them. They both make great skirmishy. In some ways, Rogue Trooper's got more going for it because it's, you know, it's future war. You're right in there. Um, whereas Nemesis the Warlock, there's not very many fights in it, actually. Um, not that you can do more with Terminators and all the rest of it. <laughs> Terminators. Um, but there's also not very many sort of protagonists on the alien side. There's Nemesis and occasionally a few of his mates, but usually just him. So it's, it's a little trickier on that front. Whereas Rogue Trooper, it just sells itself. North, Southers, you know, gas. Chem clouds. That's when you do it. Is because it's relevant to the the game materials, yeah. Uh, because it's all about the environment and getting the right feel for doing New Earth would be absolutely predicated on how thick are the chem clouds and all that sort of stuff, and how, are they dropping something new on you and so on. Um, but that's yeah, that's one for another day, basically. Mm -hmm. Right now we're doing Conflict Forty Seven and. It'd be nice to go back to those new games. I've really enjoyed doing them. They're, they're, each of them been a, a real pleasure in their own way because it's, again, the older you get, the more you go, you turn back to the things that marked your childhood overall. And 2018 was another one for me. I literally remember reading it in the playground. Uh, I think you see a little bit. I mean, at the moment, you'll, you'll still see a little bit of a drip feed through of, sort of some figure well, sets yeah. and the like. I mean, I think they just announced the SJS judges. Will be out there because there was quite a there's quite a backlog of stuff that was looked at and, and designed and stuff and it's quite possible we'll see that sort of stuff slowly drip fed through. Yeah, and in some ways, if anything has done for 2008, it's more likely to be another dread title mm. with some description or like a dread supplement like the apocalypse. No, not uh, block war was mm. the one they did, wasn't it? Mm. Shell with apocalypse war, thanks mm. Putin. Mm. Um, <laughs> we talked about doing cursed earth for that because that's a uh, a great grab bag of lots of different things uh, and a place to run campaigns and you know features in Hot Dog Run, and Judge Charles Saga and stuff like that. So there's some really solid material in there to go after. And that's the funny thing with 2008 games, they because the Scott comic strips have been running for, you know since the 80s and so forth, there's such a giant wealth of information, it often comes down to like, what bit do you do of it? You know, which artist do you yeah. take your inspiration from, from the miniatures and so forth, and which storyline do you follow for the story? Mm. Because there's a ton of it, and it's actually better to focus on something <coughs> within it. And within that, Judge Red actually forms it, its own topic in some ways, because it's, it's a different setting, it's outside the mega city, uh, and it's kind of cool for that, I like it a lot. But I say, whether we get to do anything or not with that, I don't know yet. It'll be some ways down the track if we do, or if I won't be involved in I don't know. I've got a question more to do with just general game design. Sure. So now we've all got the opportunity to get together and play games like we never do, could be, you know, mm. 40 years ago. Mm. And so the competitive element arises more often. People get together to be competitive and, and then it and it sort of evolves. Yeah. As a game designer, how do you cope with that when you're producing a game where you know some people are going to play at home with their yeah. friends and some people are going to go to a big hall and they're all going to want to, you know, somebody wants to win kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you make a decision not to make a competitive game? Say, this is Sometimes, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like the, the 2008 games are not designed to be competitive games. Yeah. Yeah, they've got value systems in them, in them, so that you can go like mm, about this number of guys versus that mm. number of guys. Yeah. But honestly, the game system itself is so random, uh, and the armory cards and stuff like that are so random. On top of that, it's absolutely anybody could you know it could yeah. go any way from there. Yeah. All you know is you're starting at a similar point. Yeah. That's not a competitive game in and of itself. Something like Blood Red Skies um, is actually it's. Um, I don't know how to describe it. Because it only emphasises a handful of elements and there's a lot about mm. positioning, mm -hmm. the game's actually built around positioning. Yeah. Um, the the elements of your pieces that allow you to position, yeah, they have a bearing on it, but they're, they're not everything. <laughs> so within that, it's quite simple to make it competitive because everybody just runs off a similar set of points, values. You know, we assign mm. values to the stats, we assign values to the traits they have, 
everyone's got the same points money, everybody pays the same for the cost for their pilots, mm -hmm. there's no army list per se at all, right. um, so you can just pick your stuff and go, okay. and it will be, by definition, because everybody's running off the same values, mm -hmm. assuming that we've got the formula right for the values, and we more or less have, you'll be on an even footing and it's down to how you play, yeah. and what your dice roll of course, yeah. but you're always subject to that. Yeah. Things like Conflict 47 kind of occupy a middle ground between those two mm -hmm. extremes um, in the it can be very much driven on, like, I collect this army just because I like the idea of it, I think it's cool, mm. or I collect this army because it's effective on the tabletop, or both factors that can come into play when you're doing something like Conflict 47. So it's far more like something like old 40k yeah. Yeah. was for me, particularly 2nd through 3rd edition, which yeah. is the main ones I worked on. Yeah. Um, and it's a balancing act, I'll be honest, it's a balancing act yeah. between the two, because you, you want to leave open as many possibilities as possible for mm. people who just want to have a cool looking World yeah. War II army, you know. Mm -hmm. And at the same time you've got to limit those possibilities a bit, so you can try and balance them off against one another for the more competitive circuit. You do have to accommodate a competitive circuit on something like that. Mm. We know it exists for bolt action. Yeah. It's bound to come across into Conflict 47, probably not quite as strongly, mm. Like well, the gentleman said earlier on, one of the reasons that the, the units in Conquest said didn't go that well is because they weren't really very competitive. Yeah. Right. There wasn't much reason to take, to take them. them. Yeah. I've come up in a relentless barrel of commercial games design, mm. so when I design rules for something, it's to sell them. Yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because we, we, went, we went through a little bit of this just to, as an example in a discussion about the zombies. <clears throat> and some people are saying, oh, oh, the zombies should be you know, just, just a meat shield. Just really, really cheap meat shield. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's fine, but I've been down this route before with these previous armies, things like orcs, things like scavens, mm -hmm. stuff like tyranids. And the problem is you're spending nearly the same amount of money to buy those cheap meat shields as you would be to buy something far more effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So guess what people do? Yeah. They buy the more effective thing. Yeah. They've got a limited amount of budget, they've got a limited amount of painting time. So they're not going to get, a, some of them will, God bless them, but <laughs> most of them won't. Yeah. So you know that, so you may know to make the, the zombies damn hard, ridiculously okay. tough, comparative to a man with a rifle, because they have to be. Yeah. They don't have range, they're slow. They've got to run up to you and bash you on the head, so they've got to be very, very good. And that's the kind of philosophy I have through all of it. And. I just have to say trust me on things yeah. like that because yeah. I do have a lot of experience with it cool. and we will do testing as well. That's the other thing you can do really easily these days. You can test the bejesus out of things. Right. Um, you can get together an international group without too much trouble, mm. uh, put the rules out to them and get their feedback. I mean hell there's guys who do it professionally these days, you can really? pay them money. Yep. Wow. Yeah. yeah well plus the other thing is uh, there's stuff like Tabletop Simulator. Yeah. Where you don't even need to physically get together. Yeah. You can play games on tabletop simulator or what have you, which is there. I believe Bolt Action has been done for it. Right. Yeah. So it's not a difficult thing to actually play games with other people online too. And you can do anything you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. You can take any forces you like. Yeah. Uh, and that removes some of the problem that you get with playtesting as well because, well, you know, you, you can go like, oh, yes, this is a walker and so forth. It's always a bit unsatisfying. It's also. Yeah. A little bit off as well. It's not quite right size and dimension, so it's, like, mm. it's always much nicer to play with some either the actual models or something that's a very close proxy to them. And that's not easy for everyone to produce. Either they can't just pull them out of their asses. Yeah. They might be able to pull them out of their three D printers given time, but again, time expense, blah blah blah. So there's actually it's it's harder and easier uh, on that front okay. is because it's easier for people to communicate. Powerful winning lists will zip around the world. Mm in no time flat. Okay. Everyone knows how to use, how to get one in no time. <coughs> People will analyse the data and share it with one another and go, actually I think you will find that there's a 0 0.5 point yeah. drop per model on the yeah. effectiveness of these yeah. things due to maths yeah. and so forth. Um, God bless them, you know, go for it. It's a big chain in it from how it was. You know, yeah, it's been gradual yeah. uh, and it's always kind of been there ever since the 90s, yeah. really, with the competitive scene. And it's always, always away. been there in America <laughs> as well. Right, okay. People tend to get down on tournaments sometimes about competitive players, um, which I understand. I mean, obviously as a designer I do too. But the reality is that they're, they're a huge tool for getting people into the hobby. Mm. Massively important. Yeah. Because that thing about getting people together to play a game, yes. 
it's the easiest way of doing it. Yeah. It's the one easy way you've got of getting strangers together into a space to play yeah. games with another. We're going to have a tournament. Yeah. Everyone knows what we're doing. Yeah. All right. And they come and they bring yeah. their game face, you know. Um, and that's why there's a ton of tournaments. Yeah. This counts more than quadruple for the United States, where typically your game store, your friendly local game store is about an hour or two away, maybe, if you're lucky, if you live in yeah. close to an urban area. Of course. Maybe four hours away, if you don't. So, going to one is an event, you know, you take the kids and the wife and they go shopping and do whatever and you go to the store. You're not just going for a pot of paint. <laughs> you don't just drop by for a pot of paint. No, yeah. you order it online these days. Yeah. You turn up for the event. And for a long time now, again, since the 90s, a lot of them have an event space because yeah. what's space in American stores and yeah. so forth. So it's always a, a big throb from yeah. America about um, tournament play, competitive gaming, and so yeah. forth. Um, so, yeah, it's, and it, and it pays to listen to it and it pays to try and accommodate it. Obviously, the other, the extreme end of that is you don't want it to rob your game of flavour either, you know, because you've still got those first guys who just think it's cool and want to collect some models in an army that doesn't suck, yeah. and you you need to try and accommodate them too and not blitz them out of the position. And it's kind of what you've been seeing happen with Games Workshop rules for those who still follow them okay. is that they they are completely enthralled by the competitive crowd because it drives sales and it, it drives money, it drives miniatures and all the rest of it in a very perceptible way. For me, and for a lot of people like me, I suspect that's not what we got into gaming for in the first place though. Mm -hmm. It was something to do with your cool looking army once you collected it, but it wasn't really why you collected the army. And I actually feel that's true of a lot of people. They don't collect armies to win, no. they collect them because they think they're cool. cool. Mm. But they're, they are, at the same time, they get projected into an environment where they do need to be competitive, yeah. otherwise they just get to be sad. Yeah. Ooh, I collected mm. a bad army and I'm sad there. now. <laughs> so you, you do need to try and balance those two factors yeah. as best you can, yeah. that's really what it comes down to. That was, that was actually one of the reasons when we asked to do Act on Panzer. Um, we knew that lots and lots of players, war, uh, bolt action players, etc., collected lots of tanks, tanks and not necessarily being able to use those tanks in the way they wanted to, yet their yeah. collections were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it was, you know, we, Mike and I, we'd had a, uh, you know, we developed a game that we played at our local club and we brought their 170 seconds or 15 mil or whatever type tanks and just used to play these tank games out because they like tanks, because yeah. we just like tanks. Yeah. and. I say when Warlord said, you know, have you got a game? And said, oh, somebody say that. Yes, we have. Um, you know, when we we pitched it to them, we, you know, we said this is very much, it's for those people who just want to get together and push their tanks around and shoot other tanks up. It's not designed to be a, you know, a super tournament, tournament uh, campaign type game, but people I've seen have started to do that. So it, it, was, it, was, it, was nice. it was nice to take it that way. It, was, it, it yeah. really was simply, because I, I, I'm not a tournament gamer, and it's because I'm not good enough Maybe for a start. Yeah. Um, so it was, it, was, it was pleasurable doing that. And the other thing that sort of relates to this a little bit is, is, is one of the things I most hate about some tournament power gaming is where a player will take a rule almost like deliberately out of context. And, this is, and it's, it's actually the fault of the designer or the fault of the person who's writing it, is the difference between rules as intended and rules as written. Yeah, you and we just fall, and I've, I've fallen into that trap so many times that you, you, you and this is why you need extended playtesting to different, to, 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 to wider groups, is that quite often a lot of playtesting goes on with those people you know, who know the way you do, and they know the way you think. And so, how you interpret that oh, rule. Oh, it probably means that. Right. Yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. need he probably needs that. Yeah. Yeah. Does it tell you that? Yeah. Yeah. And and I found so many times that people come back and say, Of course it and then I look at it, oh no, it actually it doesn't. Yeah. And actually yeah. the way I've written it is quite clumsy and it could be interpreted in many different ways. So yeah. that's yes. one of the things we tried to do with Acton Panzer, you know, Paul Sawyer was a great help in this. It was like we really fine tooth comb that to sort of like cut out all that sort of But yeah, fresh pairs yeah. of eyes is yeah. really key yeah. for that stage yeah. in the process. But we still miss some. And yeah, yeah, yeah always. But, that's important, I think, you know, it's that, that, that being very clear. Well, the, the other factor is that the, the, you can get people to read things, you can send it out to playtest groups, and playtest mm. yourself and all this sort of stuff. Nothing, nothing will ever quite prepare all set for the, the thing that happens when it goes out worldwide and you sell thousands of copies, mm. all right? Um, there's always some stuff in there that's just flown under the radar mm. um, until the point where some guy in Ecuador or what have you gets it and goes like, oh, 
uh, I can do that, can I? And it's like, oh, I, I suppose you could. It's a very weird way of doing things, and nobody's ever thought of it before, but yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can, yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> because now, like, they'll spread like wildfire. Yeah, and yeah. by next morning, everyone Everybody will know knows. about it. Yeah. Yes. You, sir. So, speaking about terrible times, um, is there anything in Acton Panza working on to get, like, French and Italian in there? F- funny, funny, funny you should say that. We've just, in fact, this week, we, we've been, Mike and I have been, we're here, and we're discussing um, the, the first supplement for it, which will basically be focusing on the early part of the war. So, Blitzkrieg, the Low Countries, and the desert especially, early Barbarossa and the like. So it'll provide you with, you know, I mean, because from a warlord perspective, they want as many of their models as, as stats in the game as possible. So, yeah, so there will be, um, there will, there's a supplement planned. Um, it will primarily focus on, on early war and the Western Desert. Um, it will have, obviously, the stats for all those tanks. It will have asset cards and um, to relate to the supporting of those, even you know, of the French, of the Italians, early British, early Americans, and the Japanese. We'll be bringing the Japanese in as well. I mean, I know there wasn't a lot of great deal of tank combat, unless you're talking about like side panel or something like that. But you know, we, we wanted to our uh, warlord to, you know, or people who own those tanks to to to, to use those. Um, event cards that sort of take into account those specific theatres, um, just those little nuances that that, that, that make it um, that, that, that make it that little bit different. So you know, snow effects, uh, sand effects, um, all all those environmental things. So yeah, for sure, that's definitely coming. Do you know how? Is it going to be a book or a PDF? It will be. What? It will be a book. Will be a book. It will be a book. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be, I think it's probably going to be somewhere in the size, look like the size of a, of a standard bolt action. Is there any ideas to put that, put that in the Warlord app as well? Because obviously, also with the new Conflict 47, the Warlord app coming out and being a pay to. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. talking to the guy actually earlier on about Blood Red Sky stuff. He's, he seems switched on. Um, yes. Yes, he wants to do everything. Eventually, mm-hmm. um, acting panels. I don't know how involved it is, but I would imagine so. I, I mean, it'd be, it'd be quite easy to plug that in in comparison to something like to something like bolt action. So yeah, I mean, I think it's it, 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 it's a question of Waller's own bandwidth of them getting round to be able to yeah. to talk to the right people but at the right time. It's it's one of those things where people using apps to build their army lists is something that's become standard now. Mm-hmm. It is uh, a fairly key feature for a lot of people. Is like, is there an app for it? Mm-hmm. Just like all the YouTubes that show me how to play it and things like that. And it's just the, the shift that you've got to get over the years of how things work now. We all carry little computers in our pockets. So, of course, people would like to be able to figure out their army list on them. And preferably use them for reference during the game, too. Mm-hmm. Handled right, that can be a real benefit, though. And, um, yeah, really help out. Instead of to dig through a rule book. Can't get on with it myself, of course, because I'm old. But... <laughs> I can see the utility, certainly. Alright, I think that's our time. Unless anybody else has got anything crashing, you can get me in the middle. There we go, one last one then. It's not really a question, just want to thank you both for the big great game. Really enjoy it. Take me back to my youth. Uh, that's the plan, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Alright, thanks a lot, guys.